evening, everybody. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, this is a special meeting of the Princeton Council about transportation issues. So hopefully that is why everybody is here. And while we're um, working out some technical details, we're going to sit down. Um, I thought if we could just go around the room and if everybody could stand up and just say your name and uh, your transportation affiliation, that would be great. Um, I think I know everybody here. I'm um, Mayor Liz Lumpert. Well, we start with the table and then we'll... Um, Councilman David Cohen, Woo. Councilwoman Eve Niedergang, uh, Christine Simington from Sustainable Princeton and Temporary Tech Help, uh, <laughs> Council President Jenny Crumiller, uh, Councilman Dwayne Williamson, Councilwoman Leticia Braga, and Councilman Tim Quinn. And we also have uh, Mark DeShield, our administrator, and Dolores Williams, the clerk. And I'm going to pass the mic. Hello, Jenny, you gave me all that <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Place. I'm the um, planning director for Princeton, and I guess I'm interested in all aspects of transportation because of that. Hi, good evening, Deanna Stockton, municipal engineer. Hi, I'm George DeFerdinand. I'm the chair of the Princeton Board of Health, and I'm interested in health and all policies, getting people to move because of health. Hi, I'm Lisa Sariusol, I'm chair of the Bicycle Advisory Committee, and I'm definitely interested in getting people moving, <laughs> health-wise and, and uh, for this, the environment. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Kim Jackson. I'm the director of Tiger Car, Transportation and Parking Services at Princeton University. I would just say transportation's what I live, breathe, and do every day. Kristen Apke, I'm the Director of Community Affairs at the University, and I just go to meetings with Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Eve Colson, I'm Vice Chair of the Zoning Board, and I've lived here for 29 years, and I like the fact that this is a pretty... Uh, I, I want it to stay the way it is in terms of transportation, and get better, you know, walkability and all that. Hi, my name is Dawn Thomas. I'm here because I'm interested in climate change, and there's a need out here for climate change, so... Rob Widener with the Transportation Trust Fund. And Bruce Mayall, I'm working here with Ms. Wright from the Social Desk. I'm Sundar Sharma. I'm the ex member of the African Safety Committee and also ex member of the Complete Street Committee. So you can see I'm really interested in transportation. And presently, I'm on the uh, CRC, the Commission on the I mean, on the Civil Rights Commission, and I'm also working with Ralph on a number of studies for related to transportation. So, so you can see I'm very much interested in transportation. Scott Sellers, I'm with the Transportation Trust Fund and also chair of the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee. Hi, I'm Scott Covey, and I'm with the uh, Public Transit Committee and the Transportation Communication Task Force. Hello, I'm Erica Daywell, and I'm with the Human Services Commission. Hi, I'm Veronica Levine Weber, I'm the Vice of Human Service Commission. Hi, it's Peter and Betsy Brown, we're just citizens, we live in Edgell Street. And my name is Stephen Cotillo, I'm a member of the uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee, and the Climate Freak. <laughs> <laughs> Jack West, I'm a land use engineer, and I'm the Transit Trust Fund. I'm Lieutenant Jeff Nauer, I'm with the Princeton Police Department. I'm Bob Altman, Chair of the former Complete Streets Committee and a member of the Traffic Safety Committee. I'm Louise Wilson, member of the Planning Board, Chair of Master Plan Committee, very interested in Complete Streets and Green Streets and Climate Resiliency. Hi, I'm Wanda Gunning, I'm Chair of the Planning Board, and it, you know, it really is encouraging to see all these people that are interested in transportation. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Greg Stankwitz. I'm on the Princeton Board of Education, 
and I'm also the representative of the board to the, the planning uh, board. Hi, I'm John Heilner. I'm on the Human Services Commission, and uh, our particular interests are to ensure that whatever transportation options are considered uh, take into account the needs of the low-income uh, groups in our town, and also, as my colleague Erica pointed out before to me when I said that, she said, don't forget the elderly, which would be me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeanette Timmons. I'm just an interested citizen, and uh, my concerns are for pedestrian transportation, namely crossing the street safely from one end to the other without having to stop cars from hitting me. And interested citizens never adjust. <laughs> Session. Hi, I'm Brenda Patel. Um, I've been my in this area for many years, and I'm on the Board of Health. Hello, my name is Perry Jones. I'm here with the uh, Bicycle Advisory Group. Hi, I'm Amanda Arsher. I'm also on the Bicycle Advisory Committee with a very serious interest in safe routes to school. Uh, Jerry Foster, I'm uh, working for Greater Mercer TMA and as well as uh, I've got a bicycle walking advocacy uh, interest. Hello, I'm Dan Rappaport and I'm on the Bicycle and and advisory committee, and I'm interested in all aspects of transportation, especially in improving bicycle and bus transportation and doing anything that we can to not have to um, have congested pricing in Princeton. Hi, I'm Jenny Ludmer, and I'm here also from the bike. Hi, I'm Adam Bierman. I'm running for Princeton Council, soon to be an independent candidate. Um, I was going to ride my bike here, but I don't have a light with my bike. I have a big fight with my wife. I've ridden my bike my whole life. I grew up here. But this, she said, no, no, no. So, you know, I, I lost. Anyway, so I drove this time. But I'm getting a, a light for my bike. <laughs> I'm Bill Schofield. I'm with the Human Services Commission. Hi, Lori Harmon. I'm vice chair of the Bicycle Advisory Committee. And I did ride my bike here. Good luck. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Ian Sachs. I'm on the planning board and the board of Sustainable Princeton. And I used to be the liaison from the Environmental Commission to uh, the Bike Advisory Committee. And um, I'm also on the Municipal Green Team. So transportation is something that is a priority and a, a crucial concern for all of these activities that I'm involved with. So this is great. Yeah, are you also a council candidate? No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 Hi, my name is Fontla. I am a volunteer who is in the council. Great. Is that everybody? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. You'll see that um, we have a lot of different groups represented here. Paul Boltman, you can introduce yourself, right? I did. Okay, good. Um, okay, so um, first before we get into this, I wanted to open up the meeting. If there's anybody who has any comments for anything that's not already on the agenda, anybody want to speak to something non-transportation related? All right, seeing no one, we'll close the regular public comment. And um, this is the first meeting of its kind that I know of um, in Princeton, and the idea of it is to bring all these various groups together um, at least twice a year. So this is the first meeting in the year and there'll be another one um, in October. And so for this meeting right now, the hope is that people will get to meet each other if they haven't already for the different commissions that are working on transportation issues. There'll be an opportunity for us as a large group to get a sense of all the different projects that are going on this year in the town related to transportation and to give folks an opportunity to give input to those projects. Um, so we're going to run through quite a few reports um, and we're going to get um, basically high level reports, open it up for each of these topics to get some input with the recognition these are all ongoing projects. Um, so there'll be additional opportunity to weigh in. Um, and we'll see how it works out. Um, like I said, this is the first time we're trying this process, so at the end, I definitely am interested in getting feedback so we can do it better in the future. 
if people have suggestions. So I'm going to start with the first report, which is just an explanation of all the different groups that are here and how they relate to one another. Um, so um, we put together this um, rough chart here. Basically, you can think of these um, three different categories of groups. So there's um, your policy making group, which is primarily the council, but also the planning board um, has the um, ability to make some policy in terms of approving the master plan. Um, and the Board of Health is um, one of our few, I think maybe the only board that can make up its own ordinances um, and pass its own ordinances. Um, both the planning board and Board of Health also can act in addition to their policy making role, can also act in an advisory capacity to council. Um, and then we also have quite a few advisory groups. I'd say probably most people in the room are a member of an advisory group. Um, and we have standing committees, which are things like traffic safety, transit, bike advisory, and human services. And then we also have ad hoc groups, which are groups that are formed to work on specific issues and might just last one year. And then we might form a different ad hoc group around a different issue. Um, so this got cut off, um, but the ad hoc groups that are here tonight, there's one on transit communications, traffic calming, and uh, sidewalk and lighting. And then finally in the third column, there's the operations, and uh, that tends to be staff. And it's really important um, for people to understand just how the government works, that there's these three different groups. And it, the government works the best when we all sort of stay in our lane, and so you don't want the policy makers to be doing the operations, and you don't want the operations to be making the policy. Uh, but we all have to work together to make sure that um, the policies that we're implementing get implemented, and that the policies are put together in a way that they can be implemented. So it's important that we get good advice. Um, so hopefully that was more clear rather than less clear. Um, is there any discussion about this or any questions? Yeah, and I guess we can have a mic. Yeah. First of all, thank you for having this such a meeting and uh, also thanks all the audience. I think it's a wonderful reading. <coughs> great plan, great idea. Uh, some of the things that I kind of did, I'm talking about the flow chart. And how does this flow chart relate with the circulation plan, which I did review it? Because the circulation plan still calls, I, I'm sorry, Dan, I didn't have a chance to talk to you. It still talks for the complete street committee that, you know, Mr. Pelty, the New Jersey State, and the county adopted the complete street committee. I understand that's no longer there, which is not in there. So, what I'm kind of my question is how do we take this flow chart and update our circulation plan, which is not consistent with the flow chart that we have. That's, I'm sure you have plans to update it, but we like to see how do we take care of the complete street community functions, which are so important and so basic to the complete, I mean, to the transportation, including the environment, you know, all that. So my question is, how do we correlate this flow chart that you presented, which is not clear to me, and then when I review the uh, circulation plan, it's totally inconsistent in my mind. And I did look at the circulation plan in detail. So there's nothing in there that talks about it, so. Okay, I, I, I wanted to answer that by saying one of the... change was to be more focused on specific tasks and, and specific projects. So if I think when we we could and we can consider that appoint a committee or a task force to update the circulation plan for instance. Is that what you're asking? No. Uh, this is perfectly fine. Oops. Sorry. This is perfectly fine. What it had a purpose. And the purpose should be consistent with the circulation plan, which is the overriding. Which is the in the master plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's in the circulation plan. 
I mean, the circulation plan is an element of the master plan. Yeah, right. Right. So and that's which is dated 2017, and which is kind of highlights that. Right. So I can. Or David, do you want to? I mean, we. Can, so you got the mic. So you have to go ahead. So first, you're absolutely right, Surrender, that we do need to update the circulation element of the master plan to correct the references to a committee that no longer exists. And I, rather than going into a lengthy response to your question, um, two of the items on our agenda for tonight speak directly to what you're concerned about. Deanne's going to make a presentation about the approval process for roadway projects which is essentially what you're asking, is how are we going to ensure the complete streets policy is implemented in our roadway projects? And so she's going to talk about that. And she's also going to talk about um, the state standards, sustainable Jersey standards for compliant complete streets policy in town, which there are additional changes that we need to make to our ordinances as well as our master plan to be compliant with the, the state standards for uh, complete streets plan. And Deanna has also got a separate topic where she's going to address that. I, I read through all that. I understand that. Well, mine is a, actually a simpler question. Are we going to update the circulation plan, which is dated 2017, which highlights the objectives and purposes and in detail from history committee. Yes. Is, so, is, is that is that all relevant? I did turn it off. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's. Yeah. And the what we're going to offer is we'll be glad to help Deanna or anybody who else you know. Well, the the group that updates yeah. that is the planning board. So if you look back here, as I was mentioning, the planning board makes policy in terms of the master plan, sure. the circulation element is the part of the master plan that talks about transportation and that's the responsibility of the planning board and the planning department and it is on the agenda for item number five so we'll be coming back to that thank well, you I, I understand that but i'm saying if it is you know to be updated which is what you're saying is part of the planning board which is understandable i just wanted to highlight that we need to update that document which is attached to the minutes of today's meeting. It's on the agenda. So what was passed out was the agenda for today's meeting. And so that is why it's topic number five on the agenda. Yeah, all right. Great. All right. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I think it's a wonderful idea to have these kind of working meetings. And I think it's a great idea. I wanted to let you know. I think it's perfect. Great. Thank you. So, thank you. Okay. Um, and that's, are there any other questions about? Okay, so that actually um, flows well into the next report, which is um, from Deanna Stockton, and this is, um, yeah, just don't turn that mic on when I'm done talking. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great way to keep control over it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, this is, a, <laughs> this is a question that comes up often from different advisory groups is what's the right time and how do people get their input <laughs> into a road project? And so we thought since we have everybody in the room today, we can review that process um, and how advisory groups can work best with the engineering department um, in particular as a road project. Um, gets developed and implemented. So I'm going to turn over to Deanna. Can everybody hear me? There we go. Uh, thank you. Just so everybody's aware, we have about 120 miles of roadway in Princeton that we maintain and um, I think a somewhat similar amount of sidewalks and pathways. So um, every year we put together a capital budget. Each capital budget requires a look ahead for the next six years. So um, we work with the sewer operating committee and public works to really try to lay out what projects we're doing in the next year and then the, the five years after that. Um, and then that goes to council, CFAC, um, and everybody else for uh, adoption as part of the municipal budget. So once we have our project list for the year, um, 
roadway projects require a lot of interaction with neighborhoods and with um, interested residents. We don't typically use the same process if we're just taking off the surface, surface of pavement and putting a new surface back on, or if we are maintaining sidewalks, replacing uh, you know, cracked, broken, lifted slabs of sidewalk. We don't typically do public meetings. So with a road project, um, we start off looking at all of the crash data, typically get three to five years of crash data from the police. We look through that, we put together crash diagrams, we try to see what the cause of crashes are so that as we're going through our design process, we can address those. Uh, we have a complete streets checklist that we had put together. Um, it's, it's kind of a coral, it's a collection of different um, checklists. It's the state highway department's um, checklist and then we added in from other municipalities. I think Chatham was one of them that had a pretty comprehensive checklist. So we fill out the checklist. That includes a lot of information about roadway data, geographic <coughs> location, are you near a school, are you near a transit stop, are you near a, um, the dinky line, that type of information. We put in zoning. We pull out the community master plan and we start to look at the bike and um, the sidewalk master plans to see if there's pieces of the system that we can implement as part of the project. So we, we take all of this information and we start to look at putting together a base map um, to see what do we have, what can we accommodate, you know, what are the trees, what are the other existing conditions. And we often try to then start with um, a web page on the municipal website so people are aware that this is coming out. Uh, the first real reach out to neighborhoods is when we're asking for storm sewer information. So if they have roof drains and sump pumps uh, that discharge, we look for that information as, as well as any information on their utilities, where their utilities come into their sites. Um, and then we work with the sewer operating committee to do a whole video inspection of the storm sewer lines and sanitary sewer lines. So like I said, some of our roads are chosen because the sewers need to be worked on. Other projects are based on the condition of the roadway and then we, we add in sanitary sewers if that requires work at that time. Um, so we go through this process, then we, have, we work with the arborist, the municipal arborist. Um, we give him a set of the plans and we ask him to go out and look at all of the trees within the corridor so that he can identify, well, one species for us, but then start to look at um, giving us a condition of health, you know, a report on all of the trees within the corridor to see if anything should come out as part of the project. Um, and we've gone both ways on the replanting side of that. Uh, we do work with the arborist to get a planting plan. Sometimes it is part of our road project. Other times we delay it until we have a contract for a landscape contractor. Because, um, you know, road contractors don't necessarily care about putting a tree in the ground like a landscaper might. So, um, so that goes both directions, but that's what we do. We interface with the arborist, and then, I, then the arborist, I think, works with the shade tree committee to update them on the tasks that he's accomplished. Um, then we work with our traffic safety committee, and that was up on the, the screen previously. The traffic safety committee is an internal committee staffed by police, public works, engineering, and we have a citizen representative and a council representative. And um, in the traffic safety committees, it's not just to assist us with looking at road projects. What this group does is we field all types of concerns from neighbors, residents, non-residents, anybody that has a traffic safety concern. And we meet once a month to go through these concerns to identify if further work needs to be done, if it's, if it's our responsibility, if it's a state issue because of the state highways, and then we, we work through that process. So it may result in something like public works going out and adding more signs or police going out and doing more enforcement. But I digress. So traffic safety will also look at our plans at that point and, and we'll review the traffic 
crash data and go through that information. Talk about if we're looking at any proposed improvements, talk through that with Public Works. Um, because, you know, there are concerns of how do they maintain the roads depending on what, say, traffic calming that we might suggest as part of the project. So um, we have that meeting and then we have neighborhood design meeting. Typically with the neighborhood, it's one meeting during design um, and then we have another meeting during or right before construction. But depending on what the topics are, what the concerns are, what the needs of the neighborhood are, we can have four and five neighborhood meetings. Like our, um, our residents from Edge Hill here, I think we probably had four or five neighborhood meetings with you folks, uh, both, you know, on the street, in the office, you know, doing email blasts, making sure everybody is on board. So that's the process we typically take with the residents. Uh, if there's anything within our design and um, what is being proposed that doesn't meet the master plan, so say we can't put in that five lane like the master plan says, then that's where we, it's our responsibility to go to council and to explain the situation and um, to get authorization to deviate from the master plan. Um, we don't typically take road projects per se to the planning board or the zoning, to, not to the zoning board, but to the planning board. Um, but in this case, it goes to the council for a deviation from the master plan. Um, and then I added in on my, um, the memo that was part of the agenda packet. You know, we do have if there's environmental impacts as part of the project that has its own set of notification that's required by the state for permits. Um, if we are doing sanitary sewer work that requires assessments for replacing individual sewer ladders, laterals, neighbors are um, contacted at that point as well. Same with curbs, sidewalks are no longer as accessible, so um, that does not trigger process. And then finally, like I said, at the end, we're going to have that construction meeting um, with the residents again at that point. So we don't necessarily send our documents to all of the individual committees. We do try to work within the staff parameters, that operation parameters, like you showed on the screen. Um, but we're willing, if, if there is a sense that instead of working through the municipal arborist, you know that we go to shade tree committee or if, if with every project we should be going to planning board at least for courtesy review, please, uh, we're willing to consider any recommendations on that. Well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions for Deanna about the... So, um, at the bike walk summit a couple months ago, um, I was at a presentation on complete streets and they talked a lot about how there's sort of a complete streets 2.0 that includes green infrastructure. And I noticed that you did talk some about trees and that kind of stuff, but is that something that you're going to start rolling in as a regular thing or do you need an element in the master plan that sort of identifies green infrastructure? Do we need our stormwater mitigation plan in order to be able to start to review those things as part of your um, street design process? Jeff, I may need your help on that answer. <laughs> that, that's a, a challenging question. I look over at Jack, he's our land use engineer, but he's also been um, working quite extensively on our stormwater ordinance revisions. Um, green infrastructure, and I have Louise here too in the audience, it, it's something, it's on our radar, we are trying to get a handle on how to accommodate it. I know with the DEP stormwater rules, it it's definitely becoming more of a requirement to include in projects. Um, it's with anything, it's limited, we have limited space to work with. So um, we're gonna have to figure out ways because at some times there's going to be conflicts. Already we have conflicts with proposed improvements with the existing built environment. 
And so if you think about it, if we need to do um, rain gardens and bioswales alongside roadways, if we already have a green strip with large mature trees, that doesn't, those two don't go together. Um, so we, we need to work more to figure out how we can accommodate it. Um, and then the second part of it is going to be how does it get maintained, right? Because you can't just put it in and leave it. It does need to be maintained and at a certain point you may have to actually clean it out and replant it and move ahead again with it. So it, it's something I think most likely with Public Works Committee, I think we should probably start looking into it more with them because they'll be up on the front line and the maintenance of these facilities. No feedback? Okay, good. Um, Deanna, thank, first of all, thank you for all your thorough work that you do for the municipality. You cited once a couple years ago a figure that I'd forgotten and I wonder if you could recall it, I'll put you on the spot, for what it costs on average in New Jersey to do a linear foot of, of resurfacing a road. I remember it sort of put into context uh, a lot of the discussion about why we're just not out there resurfacing roads all the time. Any chance you remember that or the ballpark figure? I don't remember that off the top of my head. Um, I can definitely get you that number. Jack, do you happen to remember? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what it is, but there's been studies where, um, like they compare New Jersey to other states, and New Jersey is far and above, I think it's the highest of every state, and in some cases, four or five times more. Um, like even New York, it's, it's higher than, than New York. Um, so it, it's, it is expensive. I, what the numbers are, I don't recall off the top of my head, but. Yep. Oh, I'm allowed to ask questions? Yes. Yeah. The signs of potholes, um, are they going to get worse? We have more rain, we find predictable winters. It's cat, the catamount, whatever you put, is it, could we have more expect to stop potholes? Do we have to spend more money on more expensive materials? Or is it going to happen anyway? Or? Well, pot. The, the material of asphalt has changed quite a bit over time. So uh, the binding material that is in asphalt now, that I don't think is as durable as it used to be. Uh, so it goes back to it goes back to the installation, right? If you get a good bond between the base material and the asphalt, you have less chance of potholes forming. But then you also need to do that that maintenance and. Um, you know, I think a lot of people thought, well, you can put asphalt down and then you don't have to look at it again for 10 or 15 years, and that's not really the case. You really should be touching that road again in three years, doing crack sealing and different things like that, so you're not allowing that water to get in um, underneath the top pavement. So, unfortunately, I think... It's expensive, though. It's expensive. Yeah, it's definitely expensive because, again, you're you're going back to a road that you just improved three years later, and that's that typically has not been accounted for in budgets. And we're trying to go from a, a, a point of where we're very reactive um, to proactive, and it's it's a process and it's a costly process that we have to try to figure out how to get there. This this actually came up in. This morning, CFAC meeting, what you're talking about right now. And the, and the, the question is, are we on track now, using our, our, our scheduling our workload to maintain uh, the roads at a sufficient pace that we're not in a deteriorating mode? Or are we getting behind schedule? And and the side spending side. does not seem to be keeping up with what I think we're behind. Yeah, yeah, we're behind. I think on a good year, we're getting three and a half miles
six to eight miles. And that's just a major work, and then we still have to build in that annual work of crack sealing and maybe micro sealing at, at five year intervals. Uh, and not, to, not to veer off the agenda here, but there, is, is, there, is, there, is there a possibility or a plan that we're going to address that? answer on okay. the funding, but, I, but from, from staff perspective and trying to put a plan in place, we are, we're working, um, we've got some good partners at the New Jersey Asphalt Paving Association that I've been trying to work with to help us put together um, a preservation and maintenance plan. It's, a, it's a, also a big, I'll just give a plug for the Federal Highway Administration, they have innovations every two years that come out that they try to implement from the federal level down to the municipal level. And this is one of the, the pieces um, in the local, or in the um, current set of innovations is pavement preservation, how we <coughs> um, and at what cost. So we're trying, trying to move ahead to get a program in place. Deanna, just add one more part to that. One of the issues is there's, there's two parts to a road project. One is maintaining what you have, just a mill and overlay, keeping the pavement good. But the second part of it is improving the road, whether you widen it to put uh, bike lanes, new sidewalks, um, our stormwater system is, is in, inadequate in a lot of areas, so if you have to upgrade the stormwater system. And then, as we talked about earlier, with green infrastructure, um, depending on what you do, green infrastructure has a cost associated with it. So it's, it's how far you improve the road over and above what's there today drives the, the cost and how much road you can do in a given year. Right, that's a good point. So our Cherry Valley Road Project that's currently under construction, uh, we had been working on it since 2012, budgeting it, budgeting it out over the years because we needed to get environmental work you know, environmental mapping, then we had to go for all the DEP and DNR Canal Commission permits. Then we had the mit mitigation work for the tree removal. Um, and so now in 2018, 19, we thought finally started construction and the project's about a $3 million project. Um, so yes, they take time and, and it's a lot of money because especially on that one, we're following the master plan, we went from a 20 foot wide road with ditches and no pedestrian or bike facilities to a roadway that is 32 feet wide, 30 feet wide, sorry, we had some design changes for environmental issues, 30 feet wide, which accommodates two 10 foot lanes and two five foot bike lanes, in addition to a six foot wide side path. So we were able to then accommodate the bike and pedestrian um, and address the drainage issues, which were a serious issue with those drainage ditches. Thanks, Deanna. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on. Are there any more questions before we move on? Uh, we'll move on then to um, the next report, um, which is on the Transit Trust Fund. Um, and so this is one of, something I wanna make sure everybody here was aware of. Um, so, the Transit Trust Fund was established through an agreement between the university and the former township and borough when the Arts and Transit project was proposed. And the university um, set up a fund of $500,000 um, to support uh, projects that would um, enhance transit in town. And, um, the, the fund is managed by nine people, three from the university and six from the town. And um, I think as we went around, a couple people introduced themselves as members of the Transit Trust Fund. Um, so far, the fund has spent about $100,000 of the $500,000. We still have $400,000 left for projects and we're always looking for good projects. Um, something that, does not make a good project is something like a road project or something that the municipality would already be spending money on. This has to be something that's above and beyond what the municipality would normally 
fund. So some examples of projects that the town has used this money for has been the um, Princeton bike map. Um, and I think whoever's here from the bike committee, I want to put in a plug for a new revision of the bike map. Um, and I think that would be a good application to the transit trust fund. Um, we funded um, a signature bus shelter that will hopefully um, you will see soon in Palmer Square. Um, we funded a transit study um, conducted by Ralph Weidner looking at um, regional um, transit possibilities. Um, and, um, oh, it, I feel like it funded something else. Oh, okay. go Princeton. Um, and so advertising for um, transit in town. Um, but there's, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of other potential projects and it's really important that we spend this money wisely and, and use it to enhance um, people using other forms of transit and getting out of their cars. So the way it works is the Transit Trust Fund does not oversee any projects. It's really, you should look at it as a funding agency. So we do encourage um, different boards and commissions um, you know, or departments to be the, um, the, essentially the client. So they will oversee a project, but they would put in an application to the Transit Trust Fund. Um, and there's already one application that I've gotten in, a sort of partial application that I'm waiting to get finalized, and then we'll call a meeting of the Transit Trust Fund. But if there's other groups that have projects that they say, oh, if only we had the money to do X, Y, or Z, um, if it has to do with transit, think about this fund um, as a possibility for you. Are there any questions about the Transit Trust Fund? No? Okay. Um, and Deanna, I think you're back on for the um, signal optimization for um, Nassau Street and um, also 206. Yes, so uh, we were informed by the State Highway Department of Transportation that they will be doing um, a traffic signal optimization study on both uh, 27 from Bank Street University Place to Snowden Lane Riverside Drive. Um, it goes from milepost 0.07 to milepost 1.43, so about 1.3 miles. And then they're also doing a similar study on 206 from Edgerstone to Cherry Hill Road. And um, we have a kickoff meeting with the Department of Transportation on Friday to really understand more about what is proposed. Uh, but the advanced information that I have so far is that this is essentially a study, a, a data gathering process and a study to look at signal timings. So um, DOT has already looked at the signal infrastructure to make sure that it's capable of being adapted or updated or changed for these new timings. Um, and so this next step is to gather data. They will be gathering both vehicle as well as pedestrian data. And for Princeton, I think that's really key that we push on that pedestrian piece um, to make sure that is accommodated within the study. Um, from what I understand, it does not allow phasing changes, however. So if you recall at Washington and Nassau Street, we used to have the Washington traffic as well as the Van D River traffic going at the same time. And when they put in that new traffic signal, they, they actually made those go separately. So that's a, a phasing change. And so from what I understand, that will not be part of the study outcome. Uh, so what we will be doing, um, police have been invited to the stakeholder meeting, engineering, and um, the mayor's coming as well. We'll be representing our concerns for pedestrian safety and the need for adequate accommodations. Um, I was advised that they do look at the backups and the queues on our municipal roadways as part of this project, which is great to hear because Anybody that goes out on Witherspoon Street at a certain time of day knows you may only get a couple of cars through that traffic signal because of the, the amount of pedestrians that we have. 
So, um, in short, hopefully this is a good step. We still are looking to pursue um, with the state some further accommodations for pedestrians. We have put in a request for um, Department of Transportation to change the traffic signals at Washington, Witherspoon, and University Place to go red for all vehicle traffic and allow all pedestrians to move. They denied that request, um, but we are going to be drafting a resolution and going back to the commissioner and asking that they look at it from a safety perspective. What they had done is looked at it only from a traffic engineering perspective. So we're gonna we're gonna take it back to them and see if we can get further enhancements. Um, and the other thing is none of this looks at our uncontrolled intersections. So anywhere where we have those crosswalks like Tulane and Palmer Square that don't have a signal, those aren't considered as part of that that signal optimization study. And, and that's where we've had some of our significant cra crashes. So um, again, that's where we want to go back and say, please look at it from another viewpoint and, and an overall view rather than just for moving cars through traffic signals. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you said about phasing not being part, in other words, are we going backwards? They're going to take that away from us, what they, they did with Vanity Return in Washington? Or? Still, they won't, they won't take it away, but it's not something that they would implement at another intersection. But we do have an opportunity. Um, there's something called a lead, leading pedestrian interval where you do a, get, say, three to four seconds for a pedestrian to move before the cars get a green light. So that is a possibility of something that could come out of the study. Um, but again, we'll get more details on um, Friday when we have that kickoff meeting. Thank you, Dan. Um, so does the state also have a complete streets committee or a commitment and how it, it, it sounds like what I've been uh, hearing is that their goal is to move traffic as quickly, traffic meaning vehicular traffic, as quickly as possible, and the pedestrians and bikes are just in the way, essentially. And are, are there, is there a chance, if, if that's accurate, is there a chance to start turning that around at DOT or at the state level? And is there anything that we on um, council can do to advance that goal and, and change the thinking if that is indeed the case. They do have a complete streets policy. They, I think theirs was the initial policy that kicked off the statewide push for complete streets. Um, they've had a lot of staff turnover, a lot of retirements. Um, when they had implemented the policy initially, they had gone through the entire department and done staff training. And so I think they're at a point now where they're having to go back in with the new hires and the people that have changed positions and, and gotten promotions to refresh them with the complete streets policy training. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're a highway department and it's, it's a challenge working with them at times to remind them that they do have this complete streets policy and that they do have many municipalities that have a state highway that's right in the fabric of their downtowns and their central business districts. And, and that's where we're working to, to find those other communities and, and try to get some action to, to support those of us that have that. Can I answer one for the assembly if you want to make a difference? <laughs> I just want to reiterate, as Deanna said, that the council is going to be doing a resolution next Monday because I think what we've all surmised is that we need to apply public pressure. So that's a little bit of a hint to everyone here. And actually my question was related to what you just said, was whether in addition to the resolution by mayor and council, whether 
you would recommend for concerned citizens to uh, advocate for safer um, pedestrian crossings? It's always appreciated. Um, there is an Office of Government Relations person that works with Mercer County and we can provide her contact information if anybody would like to pursue some action. I don't know if Mr. Silbershire and his town topics letter was any indication, but he did get our roads paid pretty soon after on the 27 and 206. So, so yes, can we make that definitely? Sure. I just have a question about how this study came about. Was this in response to our request for the all pedestrian cross, or is this something that sprang up on its own at DOT? I'm just I'm sort of perplexed at why this is what they're choosing to study and what the goal of this study is supposed to be. I don't, I don't have an answer. Uh, you're right, because Nassau Street was one of these areas that we have been focusing on, and then of course we have the Cherry Hill and Valley Road intersection that we're working on with 206. Um, I don't know, I can't call. Maybe we'll have more information after Friday. Right. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Yeah, Lisa. Um, I'm interested to know if they would be able to include bike counts in these uh, studies because I know for sure there are many kids who are biking from um, Library or Hodge or, or Rosedale um, across into the town for, for school uh, and back as well as, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen bicyclists along 27, and I know we, we've talked about the missed opportunity to put a bike lane mm -hmm. in the state said no on 27, <coughs> people still use it, and all day and night. Um, so I'd like to suggest that. Great, that's a great suggestion, Vlad. I had sent an email to Ralph a few weeks ago about signal op optimization um, in regards to Harrison Street, and it often got me into the habit of counting red lights and green lights since I was a child and I've never gotten <laughs> over it, and um, I can't recall, say, before 8 o'clock at night ever having more green lights than red lights on Harrison Street for the length of it, and there are more traffic lights on Harrison Street than any other street in town, and the traffic gets really backed up, say, around 3 o'clock um, when it doesn't get backed up at other places so much, so I think there needs to be a additional left-hand turn arrow from Harrison Street going towards Route 1 onto Nassau Street going to Kingston, and being that I like to think regionally, I think we also need to do something about the traffic turning off of Route 1 onto Harrison Street. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, is it true, I'll just two part really quick. First, it's become like a major thoroughfare, uh, on a way people go, go through first and you get other places. It's up to like 120,000 cars a day. Yeah. Just that number. Uh, Ralph Wagner can give us that number. Right? Not, not cars, trips. Yeah. Right. Is 120,000? Why did I think uh, it was 20 it, something? It's actually 20, 160, but yeah. it's yeah. that number is fungible. Uh, it's basically about 20% is internally originated and, and it's internal. To, and the 120 is from the outside. But uh, that's a rough number. Because the counts are taken as different months and different years. Mm -hmm. And just, I, if I digress, and if we can stop, um, David Goldfarb was talking about the sewers, and there might be a major reckoning, no pun intended, in a storm because of climate change and everything. If, if the funds come through for the sewers, which is going to be very important, would that be a major disruption for sidewalks? Some people in my neighborhood. It depends on the, the form of the work. Some of the sewer work can be done um, 
so that we just line sanitary sewers and we have less excavation. Uh, but it, it just depends on each situation. On Bank Street, for example, we have a project coming up. Half of the sewer will be dig and replace. The other half is all lining. So it, it just depends on what else is connected to that sewer and what condition it is, if it can accept something without being dug up. So it's more roadway, typically, where the sewer is, rather than sidewalk. Louise, do you have a question? Um, but just more one, a comment. I wanted to note that um, there are at DOT some real champions for bike ped mobility. And that department I've observed over the years is perhaps has taller, narrower silos than <laughs> just about any other state agency, which is saying something. And so the the bike ped silo is often very much at odds with the hardcore lifer engineering silo. No offense to any lifetime engineers. In the <laughs> but, um, but the pendulum swings back and forth, and it is swinging back toward bike ped more. And the commissioner has this uh, initiative she's pushing called Commitment to Communities. So I would just encourage you to, as a Council and of course all of us as individuals just keep running at it, you know, because you never know whether your resolution or call or letter will get to the right person on the right day and, and tip the scales. Because another thing is they have more, DOT is saying that they have more local aid grant money than they can give out right now. And they're really encouraging towns to just do projects submit projects every year, be ambitious, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think it's probably, it's a good time to try to do big things. Well, we've been very fortunate with that municipal aid. You're right, with the transportation, I guess, is that the transportation trust fund with the gas tax? Yeah. They did, they, they <coughs> very much increased what municipalities were getting. I mean, Typical projects we used to get 300,000, but with the Cherry Valley Road project, we got $900,000 with that that new allotment of money. And the mayor can announce our, our latest project, <coughs> sorry, project that we've got funding for um, that is just now being announced, right? Well, Deanna should be announcing this. But thanks to Deanna, um, we got $610,000 for Witherspoon Street. Witherspoon Street from Nassau to Green Street, <coughs> so uh, nobody gets their hopes up that it's the entire <laughs> corridor. It's it's only that section from Nassau to Green Street, and so what we proposed is um, basically replacing everything building to building. So all the sidewalks, probably the curbing, the roadway. We'll be looking at all of those underground pipes, um, and then seeing you know. Do we need another rectangular rather slashing beacon? You know, what other safety improvements can we make in there? Um, will there be any changes to the signal at, to, uh, at Witherspoon and Paul Robeson as a result of the corridor study that's going on right now? So, so that's all built into that grand application. Do you want to segue into the streets? So I've got Michael Laplace, our, our planner, is up here as well. Um, on the complete streets policy, we had updated with the former um, planning director and the planning board in 2017. We updated the circulation element uh, to really incorporate complete streets. And it wasn't just changing the policy, but also incorporating it into the goals and the other pieces of that document. Um, but the one area, when you look at the sustainable Jersey um, requirements for a complete, complete streets policy that we're lacking is really that health focus. So our policy right now speaks to the benefits of complete streets, streets in terms of health, but it doesn't go into the exact language that is required. Um, and 
so that's where we would look to um, recommend that council approve or, or work on a resolution to put together a new complete streets policy. Um, the former borough and the former township each had complete street policies that were used as a basis <coughs> for when we put together that circulation element of the master plan. Um, and Michael, I may need you to talk to that piece about the two working together. Thanks, Deanna. I was, Deanna and I have been talking about this, and um, it's good that it came up earlier in the meeting about the status of the circulation plan, the element of the master plan. I really don't see a need to update the circulation plan right now in order to move forward with this um, you know, complete streets policy because everything that's in the circulation plan from 2017 is really consistent with what you want to do and, and what the goals set forth in, by Sustainable Jersey. Um, I think you could move forward with the resolution, the work for making it you know, a municipal policy and not have to wait for any kind of update with the master plan because I think First of all, that's, this is one of the most updated elements of the master plan, I've heard that. Um, and as elements go, we have a lot of work to do. For instance, our community facilities element is really, as you know, in need of update. Um, but I think we're okay, because it really hits all those major goals, and um, we can probably work with the health department and some other entities in town to boost up those goals for, for, for health and well-being and, and wellness, and I, I think that's very doable. My department, even though it's not a master plan, an element update, we can certainly work with engineering and other departments on that. Okay, great. So just so we all understand, that's a council action then. It's just a resolution that would make it up to date with the sustainable Jersey policies. Okay, well that's great. So who's gonna take ownership of that to uh, bring that forward to council? The one other thing, well, two other things I'm a little concerned about. One is that I think that this whole idea of the green infrastructure being part, the green streets being part of complete streets, is something else that was being talked about in the workshop I was at. So I want to make sure we address that. And um, I also got the sense, although I need to delve into it more, maybe with the sustainable Princeton folk to find out exactly what feedback we got um, when we weren't approved last time. But I think that there's some accountability around the issues of complete streets design. And I, uh, you know, in other words, not just saying that we want to do this stuff, but actually having in place mechanisms to make sure that we are doing this stuff, having to do with review by people other than staff, uh, and that kind of thing. Maybe you can talk about that. I can talk a little bit about it, but I'll also look to Christina. I think from what I've seen with Sustainable Jersey, there's there's two or three different elements related to complete streets. So the first one is to adopt the policy. The next one is to institute a policy. But before you speak, <laughs> yes, there is there is one um, phrase that we would need to include, and that's improving aesthetics through decorative and functional vegetation. That's how they build the green infrastructure into it. Right, uh, so Sustainable Jersey used to have just a, an action to adopt a complete streets policy and so Princeton had that before, but then they retired that and then they created two separate ones. One was to um, you know have a complete streets policy, but the, it was a little more in depth. Like you said, you have to have the health elements in it. The second action is you have to demonstrate that you've implemented complete streets. So you would have to provide documentation that there was a case where you had met the criteria by implementing. So the next report, oh, did anybody have any further questions about the complete street policy? Yeah. Um, surrender and then. Sure. So um, maybe this will put a spanner in the works <laughs> of the planning board and everybody, but 
uh, I, I would like, in the interest of health, to push for a vision zero policy, which goes beyond a complete streets policy, uh, because it should not be acceptable that we die in traffic, just going from A to B. It should not be acceptable that we get named in traffic. I remind you that 40,000 Americans die in traffic every year. That's more Americans that get killed by guns every year. I think it is unacceptable. And I would beg you uh, to please adopt the Vision Zero policy for Princeton and really protect the people who are already lowering our transportation emissions by using our feet and our legs. Um, so I just have a question for someone who's like looked into Vision Zero. Is that something that you adopt in conjunction with Complete Streets? Or is it different than Complete Streets? Um, and how would the implementation of that be different? So, I mean, I, I think all of us would probably, in theory, be supportive. I mean, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like everybody, I think, believes in Vision Zero. It's just a question of, you know, you want to adopt it in a meaningful way. So, so. so at, at, at Deanna, have you been following this? I'm looking at Jerry Foster, Greater Mercer TMA, because he has been in to speak to us about Vision Zero. Can you quickly describe what it is for yeah. anybody who might not know? Well, while they're getting mics set up, it's actually one at a time. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you haven't heard of Vision Zero, Vision Zero is a policy that basically says exactly what uh, Taneke was saying, um, that no deaths are acceptable. Um, the primary difference, if you will, between a Vision Zero policy and your average safety campaign um, is that Vision Zero takes a holistic look at the roadway infrastructure and does not just look at safety as a function of uh, human availability. So uh, Vision Zero recognizes that uh, people do make mistakes and rather than say, oh, well, you know, it's a road, um, you made a mistake, it's therefore your fault, you know, that, that you were killed in traffic, which is kind of the traditional response. Um, they say, how can we change the roadway design so that even if you do make a mistake, you will not be killed or seriously injured? And so it's that engineering focus, in addition to uh, the education and the enforcement and everything else, uh, that sort of makes Vision Zero different from the traditional uh, safety in terms of the mechanics of, of a resolution, um, typically there has been either a resolution or an executive order. Um, in New Jersey, there have been one municipality, Jersey City, who has uh, done an executive order, and then they put together an action plan um, led by the planning department in Jersey City, um, but including all of the other operational uh, departments and as well as you know the citizens and everyone, and they came up with Vision Zero Action Plan, which was very recently adopted. Uh, Hoboken has just started down that path where they have an executive order, uh, but not yet an action plan has been accepted. So, unfortunately, I don't think we can do the technical here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, can you just describe, so we have in our master plan, we have a bike plan, and we have a sidewalk plan. I just like, very, if you just break it down, like I understand how the, how you're saying the policy is different in the Vision Zero versus Complete Streets, but practically speaking, if we adopt a Vision Zero, does that mean we're adopting a new bike plan, we're adopting a new sidewalk plan? And what does it mean mechanically when there's a road project that comes before engineering? How is it different under Vision Zero? Um, so the thing that you might do differently under Vision Zero is that you might value safety data more highly than you might otherwise value it under today's uh, scenario. Um, you're right, Vision Zero from the Complete Streets standpoint, Vision Zero is another reason to do Complete Streets. Okay. So there's no difference, there's very few differences in terms of you know what you might actually do on the ground. Um, it's just one more reason, like health, like equity, like uh, safety, it's just 
safe, safety um, motivation for doing complete streets. So it's and, it's you had vision zero and complete streets, not vision zero or complete streets. Mm -hmm. going to add on to that last point to connect it to the um, NASA Street project. When you go to that meeting on whatever yeah. that is, Tuesday, right. a vision zero perspective would be you're leaving out these pedestrian crossings. Right. That's not consistent with vision zero. So not that the state would necessarily automatically bow to that, but potentially it's not just how we, um, it's how we present ourselves either to the state or another venues um, pushing that guideline. Right. Um, so, as you know, I'm more blunt than Jerry, and I will <laughs> put it to you bluntly. Vision Zero puts health and safety considerations above everything else, in particular, above traffic, uh, vehicular traffic volume and speed, or parking. I would also add, I guess, just to make it a little bit clearer, um, you know, Vision Zero, one kind of, I mean, it's engineering the, the street in general, but one kind of piece that might be clear for people is that at 35 miles an hour, uh, a person can get seriously injured versus at 25 miles an hour, there can be less damage done. And so that difference in terms of speed design could, can make a huge difference in terms of a life or death situation. Okay, well, I personally am interested in exploring more of the Vision Zero. It seems like if it's an additional policy beyond complete streets, we should move forward with the complete streets because it seems like a pretty simple resolution to do. Um, but um, I'm just wondering what the next steps are to move forward with Vision Zero, and it seems like there's, um, maybe I'm gonna ask all the committees that are here today to take a look at it from their own um, perspectives and see how Vision Zero policy might um, impact the work that they're doing. Um, I'm just trying to think of like, because when we adopt it, I wanna make it a meaningful adoption of it, right? And I think we have to go back to engineering too, to see engineering and police, to see how they can have the, um, an operational plan in place to actually implement it in a meaningful way. So I think maybe traffic safety needs to take a look too. I'm just trying to think of, so this, the idea doesn't die, like where's the best place to have it be shepherded. If I may, Mary, I guess the, the, the concern is that there's almost like a preemption issue. Like, ideally, we want vision zero. However, we have other, uh, other um, concepts in place. And the question is, we don't want to adopt something that in some ways contradicts some things that are already out there. So I just want to make sure that they all work, seamlessly work well together. I guess that's a concern. Right. So you don't want to say I think it's less a worry that the bike master plan would contradict it. It's more, um, we just want to have the abilities in place to implement it if we adopt the policy. Or maybe we adopt the policy first to direct a plan to be put in place. I'm just, maybe this gets, I'm trying to figure out where to refer this to, and maybe it's referring it to traffic safety. I don't know, where, or Landy Moore wants to take a look? I was going to say, unless we ask all the VCCs to review their current policies, well, the ones that, 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 that have something to do uh, uh, with transportation, and review their, their policies and see if there are any real issues that, you know, any problems with Vision Zero or, or, or anything that may have some sort of conflicts in there, maybe possible resolutions to these conflicts. That's where I was thinking too of would you want to have another task force 
that could be made up of any of these interested stakeholders um, from the various committees participating from their perspective on it. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. So um, I would say after this meeting, if you're interested in working on this, let me know, um, and we'll work on setting up a task force. I don't know if there's any council. People should think about it if they're particularly interested in working on this. Well, I, I agree with everything about Vision Zero, and I really love it, but I do also want to make sure that it's not just more kind of like record keeping and reporting and talking. Like, we spent like five minutes or whatever talking about it when I think we all agree on all of the goals and we're all working together toward those goals. So I, I, I think it, it's a good idea to adopt it, but I just want to proceed with caution about adding kind of more kind of bureaucracy to all of our work. Yeah, I think it's important to um, tap into whatever um, really specific recommendations have been developed by you know, the National Vision Zero Policy Institute or whatever it is, because you know, to pick up on what Tinica was saying, we value safety and life over everything else. It actually makes it very simple. We just put a five mile per hour speed limit on all of our streets and you know, Vision Zero is achieved. But I think that when you try and find the mid midpoint between that policy and what we have today is when it gets difficult. And we're certainly not going to invent complete vision zero uh, implementation strategies in Princeton. That's, I think, too heavy a lift. Um, if there are good implementation strategies out there, that's what we should be looking at, deciding which, one of those, which ones of them make sense in our town. One thing to add to that is I hope that somewhere in this whole process somebody is keeping an eye on the aesthetics of this. I know it's not as high a priority as Vision Zero is, but you really can go down a raffle of the stuff if you start adopting high pollutant engineering standards on pollution. <laughs> Good point. Okay, I like to add like basically I'm glad that Nika brought it and I had actually brought it. Like that we made it a few months back. And uh, I think uh, we already talked about the vision zero, which is what I was going to bring it up. And I also want to bring it up science, innovation, and technology, which is in line with the task force. So the way to analyze anything is always looking at the science part of it. And not only like looking at what statistics mean, not looking just the descriptive part of it, but really the data, what it tells you. So. So in order to answer your question, Mr. Tumbler, it's not something you just put it on paper. You go back and look at the data very critically and not just kind of descriptive part of it, evidence-based data. What does it mean? And how we can take that data and implement it in Princeton in particular. So what we were really looking at is like a, whether you call it a task force or science innovation or technology, is something you analyze it deeply, not just look at, uh, you know, say, hey, yeah, let's have a vision zero and not have any facts behind it, and not look at from all perspectives on it. So that's what I would really bring to that to you, so. Um, so just want to make an offer, perhaps, that um, um, Greater Mercer TMA last year did have a vision zero uh, conference um, over in Plainsboro. Uh, we have a lot of material from that conference that we can make available to the public. Um, also, our executive director presented to Middlesex County uh, Transportation and uh, Task Force uh, just this past week, and she has a, a presentation ready to go in case anybody is uh, willing to you know, listen to that presentation as well. Okay, that'd be Thank great. You. Thank you. Are there any other... Thank you, Mayor, for asking me to be here and participate in this program tonight.
tonight and share with everyone what the university has been doing in terms of its efforts related to related more to transportation um, than parking. So uh, just a little bit of background. In 2016, as the university was completing its campus planning effort, Transportation and Parking Services was asked to look at how we might enhance our existing TDM programs to help reduce single occupancy vehicles, as well as um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce some of the congestion in and around Princeton. Um, and as a major employer, we knew that we had a lot of people who were adding to that congestion. And so in October of 2017, after we hired a consultant who helped us survey our population, we reduced, uh, we reduced, we announced what we call Revise Your Ride. And this again was an enhancement to our existing TM programs. And you can see up on this slide, we did have a mass transit subsidy, we had a carpool program and a vanpool program. But what we learned from our survey was if we incented people's behavior, they would choose alternative transportation. And the largest group participation we have is in our bike walk program. A large reason for that is a major population at the university lives within one to three miles of campuses and is in a position to ride a bike or walk to work and or perhaps take a bus, whether it be the freebie or a Tiger Transit bus, to get to their place of business. So we launched the program again in October of 2017, and to my amazement, um, this is, these are the um, total of uh, the, the people enrolled in our programs. So 23%, and actually as of today, we just did a quarterly update, 24% of the university's employees are enrolled in our Revise Your Ride programs. And I'm proud to say, as I wear my pin, that I too changed my behavior and became a carpooler. So it is possible if you choose to make the efforts. Um, in addition to what we were able to do with this, and again, just one second, Jenny, can you slow down, come back down. Our kind of tagline for Revise Your Ride was local movement, global impact. So again, this was not just about the university community, it was about the greater Princeton community. So in addition to doing Revise Your Ride, we made sure that we had um, other alternative ways for people to commute once they were on campus. So again, during the survey, people didn't have, had questions about not just getting to campus, but how do I get to where I need to be when I'm at campus? What do I do for an emergency ride home? What do I do when I need to attend a meeting off campus? What do I do when I need to attend a meeting across campus? We had our Tiger Transit system already in place, and so we use that to promote as a, a means of transportation for people to get around. We had our car share program with Enterprise. We have 17 cars on campus, and so we provided free membership to the people who signed up for Revise Your Ride into our car share program. So if people needed to get a car to go to a meeting or a doctor's appointment or some other um, uh, business off campus, they could use those cars versus, again, drive their car uh, to campus to attend that meeting. I think the second most successful thing that's happened in my career at Princeton, or maybe the first, I don't know, is our Zagster Bike Share Program. Um, this program has had phenomenal success we are, in terms of size, one of the largest uh, bike share programs in the country. Um, based on the statistics there, and there is one typo that I noticed today, we do not have 2,243 members. <laughs> it actually should have been 2,143 members. I popped an extra two in there. Um, but as of today, as I watched the numbers, this was from Monday where we had 103,000 41 trips taken. As of tonight when I left the office, we had a grand total of, and again, all day long the numbers went up, but we had a grand total of 103,995 um, trips taken. We average 458 trips per week, and the time span is about a nine minute average mean for each ride taken. Uh, graduate students, 
are probably the highest user we have. Undergraduates were high, but now the numbers for faculty and staff have also gone up. And we did include a free membership in the Zagster program for anyone who joined Revise Your Ride. As the weather, of course, is getting nicer, I just continue to see this number rise. We are looking at how we might be able to add more bikes um, so that we can continue to grow use in the community. Princeton Shopping Center has bikes. There's bikes at Barstow, there's bikes at Princeton Marriott. So we are trying to create a network of this bike share program. And again, it has exceeded what my expectations were when we launched this in 2015. And then I just wanted to share quickly, we did a follow-up um, after we launched Revise Your Ride with our faculty, staff, and graduate communities, just trying to check in and see where people were. Um, money alone was not a motivating factor for most employees, although yes, we are incenting behavior with money. That's not the reason why necessarily everybody's participating. But what we did find out from people is that one size is not fitting all. So it's very difficult sometimes for people to commit to carpool all the time or to commit to mass transit all the time. So we are looking at how we might be able to be a little more flexible in our programming to again encourage more people to join and keep people in the program. So again, things change, people move, people have babies, you know, children come home from college. So again, how might we adjust these programs based on what people's needs are? We're also looking at how we might be able to tier these incentives differently. The other interesting thing we learned was people were willing to, the next slide, Jenny, please. The people were willing to park further away from campus if they know there is a reliable bus service or way for them to get around. So again, as we think about our campus planning effort, I think most people in this room know we're going to be going across the lake. So if we were to put some additional parking across the lake, the question was, would people park out there and bus onto campus? And the answer was yes, they would, if it's a reliable service, if it's communicated well, if they know it's dependable. We have been working with the town with trying to find ways to integrate fee free e-service more within our Tiger Transit operation. We have the freebie on our Translope, the GPS app. And when you look at the map, it's now one map, and you can see the freebie bus and the Tiger Transit bus and where they may intersect. And we're looking at other ways we will be able to continue to work with the town to enhance all of our alternative transportation options. And I'll have you to take questions. inspirational what the university has done and um, do you have so I mean I, can you talk about how long this took to put together and if you have advice I mean I think ultimately and we're going to hear about the climate action plan in a minute but this whole traffic demand management revise your ride it's something ultimately that the municipality as an employer needs to look at probably in conjunction with the school district that maybe we can help Private, the smaller private employers in the community work together to do something similar. But what, can you talk about sort of like maybe some things that didn't work out so well or what your lessons learned were? So again, Revise Your Ride is an enhancement of our existing TDM programs. So we started our programs in 2009 and we did have a lot of start stops when we started. Um, I think probably the, the most important lesson learned was how important communication is and what is the right form of communication. So is it emails? Is it Twitter now? Is it Facebook? Is it, I don't know what the answer is, but again, you know, we would tell people we had things on our website and they would say, well, we don't go to your website. Now. So then the information I'm putting out there is not where I should be putting that information. So we did a lot of testing when we did our survey to find out how we should be communicating with our, our customers. And again, we found out that Twitter was a way, and so when we launched a new website with Revise Your Ride, we made sure we have a Twitter account and we tweet now any update we can think of when it comes to traffic, congestion, busing, um, anything. And hopefully, people are signing up and getting the tweets. But I think looking at how you communicate with people, knowing that, again, one size will not fit all. 
So, you know, perhaps you can get employers to get employees to carpool, but there may be days people won't be able to carpool. So what will be the alternatives for them? What are the options? How might you look at ride share programs um, and programs with the Lyfts and Ubers out there to help move employees around or employees that can use that as a means to get to um, work every day if they can't do what it is they've set up to do. Um, I, I also think one of the lessons learned is to, to know that although people will say they can't, they can. It's about, again, what, what sacrifice or commitment am I going to make? And I will honestly tell everyone in the room that I started carpooling because I broke my ankle. And I was on crutches and I could not drive. But I needed to get to work. So in order to get to work, I was motivated for someone to pick me up and take me. And by the second week, we said, why don't we just carpool? And, you know, a year later, you know, our carpool is still going strong. So I think it's taking a moment to say, how can I possibly make this work? Um, and there's lots of reasons why people can't. My hours, I might have to stay late, I may have to do this. So lessons learned to be prepared for those things to come up and have solutions if possible for them. Yes, sir. Oh, I just want to congratulate you on, on Thank you. You're, the, you're the engine for employment in this town. And and what you touched on, from when I read the Sharma Weiner report, you touched on the big things, reliability, hassle-free, is it gonna be there, does it go to places I wanna go to? You know, I think you're hitting all that. My question, just, I'm kind of like into the word thing, have you heard any key words that motivate people? I know that could change over time in your advertising, in your tweeting, and how many times do you have to hit people, three, how many touches do you need usually to get people to respond, do you know that? And, and one more, like, do you have any goals for the next five years that you wanna see? So our biggest goal, I'll answer first, or a challenge we had was to reduce by 1,200 vehicles by 2026. Wait, what, sorry, let me rephrase this. By 2026, reduce by 1,200 the number of vehicles coming to campus. We're at 605 right now. This is only year two. So people are committed to this. People are willing to, so if you want to think about what are the buzzwords, you know, talking about alternative transportation, talking about mode split, making sure people understand what those words mean and how they impact traffic and congestion, talking about sustainability, talking about reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And again, just being consistent in your messaging. I don't know that there's a, again, one size fits all on how often you should um, you know, hit people. I will tell you, we hit them hard in the beginning. Every week we were putting something out about revise your ride, revise your ride, revise your ride. And then we backed off as we saw that you know, people were joining the program. And then we started again. And we do a thank you uh, reception for the people in the program. So that was our way of kind of giving back to people who were doing this. And that's been well received. We've created some ambassadors and ask people to go out and talk to the community about Revise Your Ride. We're gonna highlight more people on our website. So all of those things continue to send that message out. And people can lose weight too, right? Yes, yes, and excuse me, one more thing. And when new employees are hired, they hear about Revise Your Ride immediately upon employment. Hi, uh, a question about the intercept parking. You, that, so you, you said that people, if, I assume that this was a survey, people indicated a willingness to participate in intercept parking if the, if the shuttle was reliable. Do you have plans to pilot that? We may with the campus planning effort. So again, as we go to the Lake Campus, we will need to put parking out on the Lake Campus and it may be that some people at Lake Campus will need to come to what I'm gonna call main campus right now, or old we'll campus, I don't know what, <laughs> I'll say Princeton <laughs> campus. Um, and so, you know, how are we gonna do that? So, it, and again, if we need to put additional parking, that's one of the places we have to put it is in, in the West Windsor area. So you would need to intercept there are a lot in transportation. And how do you have plans, uh, plans for dealing with uh, Alexander Road closing that's yeah. coming up? <laughs> 
Yes, I'm taking a leave of absence. <laughs> So we are, we are thinking about what it is we will need to do in terms of getting people back and forth. Um, as you may know, we have people out at 701 Carnegie Center, 100 Overlook, 693 Alexander. We currently bring those people over by bus, and that route will now be so long, and at peak hour traffic take, you know, to me forever. So I think that we're gonna have to be creative in what we do. I think we should look at more teleconferencing whenever possible, um, especially for those folks over there. Everyone, unfortunately, can't telecommute to work or work from home. So, you know, we will work with Princeton and, and the rest of the community to do what we need to do to try to make less of an impact on our employees. Mm -hmm. I know Maine campus occupies much of the southern end of Princeton, you know, as a Northern Princetonian, Princetonian, you know, we feel a little left out because, you know, Tiger Transit doesn't go that far up north. I just wonder if there are any plans to look at, you know, I'm sure there are employees of the university, but I know a couple who live up there, if there's any plans to extend maybe the, the routes for Tiger Transit to accommodate us uh, uh, Northern uh, Princetonians. Um, it, it is a possibility. So we will be hiring a transportation consultant to come in and look at our transit lines over the next year. And um, from that information we get from them, we'll get not only where people work and how to possibly use the bus system to bring them in, how we might be able to integrate some of the free rerouting into the Tiger Transit system. And so, you know, the possibility exists to extend into the community. I just don't have those answers yet. You're a little ahead of me. Yes? Kim, uh, two things. Um, how do you handle uh, weather uh, problems? Because people may have a ritual in which they've started to get into a pattern. Maybe they have a certain day of the week they do doctor stuff and whatever. But weather changes everything. And the other thing is I just want to make a suggestion to look at the dinky as a possible express service to be a link uh, during this period in which Alexander Street is um, closed up. So thank you. And I have thought about the dinky. I needed to get back in service. <laughs> get people back on it and, and then see what we can do to get that thing running back and forth to try to move people as quickly as possible. Um, but the first question you asked about weather, what we do is we allow people a certain number of permits that they can use on inclement weather days. We're also looking at what might be other alternatives to help people get to campus. So one option is our ride share services, the Ubers and the Lyfts, a way to get people to work who are in our programs on inclement weather days and actually get them closer to their building than probably if they have to drive and park um, to reduce the amount of cars coming onto the road um, and parking all day that don't necessarily need to be there. So um, that's what we've done so far in terms of weather. Yes. Uh, so uh, I have to commend you on all your TDM work. I think it's fantastic. Um, one thing I was curious about is, and that we spoke before, I guess several months ago, about um, the dinky and the future of that. And I was just curious if there's been any conversations with uh, Ender Transit or, um, I guess, will you be willing to, I guess, open up conversations about the, the future of the dinky and potential stops along the line um, and, you know, updating the train? And also, I think in the master plan, there's discussion about um, augmentation of um, you know, transit in, in the West Windsor area. And uh, I was just curious if you could speak to that as well. So I really can't speak about the DINKY itself and New Jersey Transit. I mean, we're willing to work with the town and work with New Jersey Transit um, on ways to improve the DINKY service. I think for me, the biggest thing right now, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but I need to get that train back. Um, and the reason I say that is there are some people who have had to drop out of our programs because of not, the dinky not running and the fact that they have to then get a bus and then take another bus and take another bus. And so in order to continue what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm, I'm heavily reliant on that service to help us move people back and forth. Um, is it a possibility that it could extend to what it does? I think there's always a possibility that it could extend, extend to what it does, but we haven't had those conversations yet with New Jersey Transit, nor have we really engaged with the town about that. What we've all tried to do, I think, is get that service back 
and then think about what we might be able to do moving forward. And the biggest thing to me moving forward is what happens in November when Alexander Street closes and how that connection might be very useful to all of us. Yes? If there was a um, footbridge, multi-use bridge over Route 1 um, parallel to the Dickey, would that help the university in any way reach that goal that you spoke about for 2026? or beyond the year 2026? So I just want to make sure I understand. If there was a bridge on Route 1... Over Route 1. Over Route 1, where? where? Parallel to the Dinky on, I guess, on the Washington Road side of the Dinky. Um, I, I, but <coughs> over Route 1? Yeah. 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 talked about yeah. Yeah. building yeah. a structure that would be on the... Dinky Bridge, oh, right, yeah, alongside it. Right, we so I think alongside the Dinky Bridge, it could be helpful to have a path that people could ride their bikes. Again, it's not a long distance between Princeton Junction and Princeton and or West Windsor, so if you're at 693, 701, so something along that Alexander Street corridor would probably be beneficial to all of us. And it would um, go... But I don't know about over Route 1. And it would go to the front of one or more of the buildings that you have planned over there between Alexander and Washington, correct? No, our buildings would be on the Washington Road side and I'm actually on the Alexander side right oh. now. So I think on the Alexander side is where we have potential to create some kind of passage, possibly. Um, again, I have not been back there to look at the land, nor am I an engineer, but it is a possibility that if something could be done, that would be an excellent place to do it. And it would not just service us in the town, it would service also those businesses along the Alexander Street corridor. Mm -hmm. That's just another new, does Uber and Lyft figure into this at all? Or? They, will. they will. I think that we all, I mean, they, you know, people have called them the disruptors. Yeah, the cab driver hate them, want to kill them, yeah. But, <laughs> but, you know, again, I think we need to, to at least have conversations with them. I agree with that. So, you know, whether we use them, to what extent we use them, how we use them, I don't know that, but I think we need to consider them as players and as an alternative form of transportation in this area. Thank you so much. Okay, Lisa. Just one quick comment. Uh, I think Louise touched on it earlier about the, I heard the keynote speech at the uh, Lang and Walk um, Summit from the uh, commissioner for the DOT and her commitment to community. And here we are talking about our commitment to community and to transportation. It sounds like we ought to engage her. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I really you. appreciate it. So it's 9.10 right now, and I'd like to try to get through the rest of the agenda before 9.30. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny um, to report on two of the ad hoc groups, the um, traffic calming and crosswalks and lighting. Okay, I can be quick. <laughs> um, so as a matter of course, when we build our roads all right, right now, we've been really implementing complete streets in general. Um, uh, where we can, we've been putting in bike lanes, when we can, we put in bump outs on curbs, um, and other things that Deanna knows, right? Um, but we haven't been putting in any kind of vertical deflectors. Uh, and so we had a committee that looked at all the possibilities for some kinds of vertical things like speed bumps. And um, we, we um, passed a resolution, the council passed a resolution to um, take away the moratorium that was there, that a previous council had implemented on those, and um, we pretty much came up with the um, with the um, idea that oh, we, we discussed it with the um, snowplow drivers and with the emergency drivers who were really in most towns, including here, are one of the you know the stumbling block to getting the um, traffic calming is those entities. And so in Princeton, we talked to them and everyone kind of came together and we have support for speed cushions 
and raised crosswalks. Both of those are acceptable by the snow plow drivers. And so the next, so what we're doing now is we are um, collecting data. So all of those cameras, this um, speed cameras that are around town are hopefully helping people um, keep to the speed limit, but they're also collecting data for us so that we can implement a traffic calming master plan where we decide um, where we're going to put some of these things. So um, we want to put them, we want to we want to decide where to put them based on objective data. That's really important just to be equal, to do it based on, and also um, not just where there's a lot of speeding, but where a lot of people are walking. Um, and, um, and we're coming up with a matrix to make this decision. So the, and the next step is, so we have gotten a lot of the data, and I want to thank the police. Um, Jeffrey Warner was here, and Sergeant Murray um, have been supportive of this project, and it's a big project to collect the data. So, and they've been very helpful and supportive, so really, thank you so much. And very soon, we're going to be coming with the data to the council, probably, So, and coming with a draft plan to, in the interim, decide where where we're going to put them, but what's become apparent to me is we need it, and especially even from this meeting is, I think we need to have a big discussion amongst the council members of how much traffic calming we're going to do because there has been an assumption, oh, we can't put these things everywhere, but everyone I talk to says, why not? Why can't we put them everywhere? And I think we have to decide we're going to put them everywhere or, or not. And if we're not, that's that's what you know. Then we, we base our decisions on the data from the traffic cameras, where people are speeding, where people are walking, and where these um, these kind of implements that make impediments for drivers, where are they going to make the most difference? So I, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion because we've had a lot of meetings like this where we hear, and I to me, and also people talking to me. When, around town, everyone wants the traffic to go slower. Everyone hates speeders. And I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a larger meeting and hearing from the public and hearing how, you know, maybe we could put these things all over. I think some towns have done that. So, I'm, you know, so it, I think it's something that's gonna happen. So the next step, though, is going to be presenting the data, some of the data, to the council, showing where people are speeding, because it's really pretty interesting, um, and showing where the most traffic is and where the most problems are. So that's the, um, the traffic calming. And I'll do the other one and then take questions. Um, so the other little committee is on um, well, the crosswalks and lighting. So, um, all, both of these things are right now taken care of with the Traffic Safety Committee, but um, this little ad hoc group is is fo focusing on really these two issues, um, and we're making some recommendations and looking at the map and um, looking at where we're, we kind of designated the important corridors where just like the traffic calming where the, the most good could happen. And we're going to be making some recommendations to the council. Um, and at the same time, we also are making recommendations to the traffic safety committee. Um, and part of our work is also creating fact sheets because people don't understand um, how sidewalks are created. Right now, there's a, a sidewalk master plan and we only build new sidewalks when we're redoing our roads. Um, and so, so it's tough because people want us to build sidewalks everywhere and we can't, we just don't have the money. So we're gonna be creating a fact sheet about that, about how you could, people can at their own expense put in a sidewalk for instance. And so we're going to be putting it together just some information so people understand, so everyone understands how the sidewalks are built and who and who pays for them. And same with the um, the repairs of the sidewalks. The municipality recently, or a couple of years ago, 
maybe a long time ago, um, changed our policy so that the municipality pays for um, sidewalk repairs. So we're looking at that. Um, and we also are looking, are going to make a fact sheet for people and encourage people to keep their sidewalks clear, not only with shoveling snow, but there are also, um, we have ordinances that require a certain number of inches um, above the sidewalk that you have to keep clear with your hedges. And as anyone who walks a lot knows how important that is, and we don't always get good compliance, and so we're looking at that also. Um, and then last, I'll just talk about, just to get everything over with, on the agenda, we have David and I are working on a project with um, about snow shoveling because other towns have had programs to encourage people to shovel. We all have a, a, a perennial problem where some people don't shovel their walks and people trip and fall and hurt themselves. And some people, it's because they're older and they can't do it or they want vacation. So we're looking at how other towns handle that problem. If um, some towns might, for instance, have a volunteer force, although I've heard that doesn't really work. That's what everyone thinks is a great idea. Um, so, but we're going to look and see if any other town, if, if there's anything that um, we can do for that problem. It's, it's a problem. And a lot of people automatically say, just enforce, give tickets for people, to people who don't do it and find them. And that sounds easy. But the problem is during a snowstorm, all of our staff is, is busy taking care of the snowstorm. And so we have trouble with that. So I just wanted to. I don't know if David, you have anything to add. We should need to move on. Okay. 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 All right, thank you, Jenny. Um, so I wanted to ask um, Scott Covey to talk about the work of um, the third ad hoc group, which is on transit communication. Um, I'm going to do this really quickly so we can move on and uh, learn a lot of things from this. So this will feed into what we're talking, what we're talking about in the task force. But in starting January, uh, with the intent of promoting all these things that we're talking about, promoting better transportation issues, specific uh, better transportation plans, specifically, or most first and foremost, the uh, the public transit options, uh, we uh, put together council put together the transportation communication task force, uh, and we're basically doing. Communication and promotion of the of the systems that are available, uh, and we're now three months in, and we've got some plans together. We're looking at calling in Transit Princeton, uh, how that will actually appear to people out in in the community uh, remains to be seen exactly. But and uh, particularly because of what um, Kim was talking about, I think we've got some a lot of work to do with the university. Uh, the Tiger Transit will be part of that emotional effort, um, and uh, it's going to be a whole range of different possibilities, whether it's mailings, uh, on-site uh, signage, um, and uh, you know, working with the press, a whole range of communication options there, and, uh, and that will be rolling out over the next uh, you know, few months. Uh, we are looking right now at a doing a kickoff of this when the Big E reopens on the 24th. So we may not be doing it actually on the 24th, but it'll be it's sort of the kickoff of what we're talking about will be sort of tied to that. And so sometime late in May. So I, I don't know that we have a whole lot else. I mean, there's a, a pretty good summary is in the, the fact that we got, so. Great, and I brought a post, <laughs> sorry. Yes. I brought a poster that you had given me um, it's in the back if it's still there, so people can take a look on the way out. I thought you did a really nice job just a draft um, poster showing all the different transit lines. It looks like the London Tube map. It's really cool looking, so I encourage everybody to take a look at it and um, and give any feedback you have um, to Scott. And he is the council liaison on that committee, so uh, if you don't have Scott's contact, you can send comments to Eve to get to the committee. You. And then with that, I'm going to turn it over. This is going to be the last presentation. Um, Christine Signington um, from Sustainable Princeton will be talking about the Climate Action Plan, um, which is um, almost ready for prime time, and uh, talking about 
the transportation element. Sure. Um, you're not quite up. You need to scooch it to the side. And you have to figure that out for me. You have magic touch. Mm -hmm. oh. Right. Well, while she's doing that, um, I'm just one of the folks at Stanbull Princeton. If I could have Molly and Jenny stand up and wave. Uh, Jenny didn't, when she introduced herself, she neglected to mention she was at Stanbull Princeton. I don't think Molly was here then. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know, Climate Action Plan essentially tries to achieve two things. It tries to um, have a set of strategies for a community to, one, reduce its emissions. Uh, to stop contributing to the problem of causing climate change, and then two, to identify a set of strategies to be more resilient to the predicted impacts of climate change. So, uh, Samuel Princeton has been working on um, helping the community identify what the priorities are um, through a steering committee and five working groups. And uh, one of the working groups uh, is land use and transportation. And um, if, raise your hand if you're in the audience and you've been a participant in one of the land use and transportation working groups. Yes, so you see we've got representation. Or if you've just been involved with the Climate Action Plan in another working group, because we do have people who here aren't on. Yes, so. Um, are we done? Okay. All right. So the, the intention of the land use and transportation working group wasn't necessarily to come up with a whole set of other plans. It was really to look at the existing ideas and initiatives that um, the groups that you all represent have been working on and look at them through the lens of greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully sort of codify these in a way that would help support and prioritize the actions that we as a community want to do to make our town more bikeable, walkable, and safer. Um, so if you aren't aware, we did do a inventory of our emissions and so when we look at the emissions that our community contributes, a big chunk is transportation, and that may come as no surprise to most of you. A big chunk is also from the built environment or commercial and residential um, properties, which how they're built and where they're built um, plays a big role in our transportation emissions because the further it takes you to get somewhere, because the buildings are you know far apart, the more emissions, the more um, the more emissions come from drive, driving on the road. Um, for So um, the steering committee has established that the town is going to achieve, try to achieve a reduction of 8% by 2050. And um, there are some interim goals along the way, but that's what we have to strive for as a community. And um, reducing emissions in the transportation sector is going to be a big um, chunk of how we're going to get there. Here's a list of all the folks who have been part of the working group and helping to inform the actions and the strategies. Keep going. And then this is the draft, and there will be um, the draft will be available hopefully by the end of next week for everyone to go in and comment on. But I just wanted to touch upon how we sort of framed the actions. One is, is is the vision, you know, that everyone in Princeton should have access to safe, affordable, reliable, and low carbon transportation and housing. Um, and that you know the way we build by using mixed-use, transit-oriented, location-efficient development will help us reduce our vehicle miles traveled. And then anything that has to be a vehicle should then be zero emissions. So that's sort of like the overriding um, um, sort of approach to the actions in the land use and transportation section. It's just an image of what it would look like, what location-efficient and mixed-use development looks like. Um, we won't go into each and every one of these. These will be available for everyone to read. But again, they were very much, if you look at them, they're going to sound a lot like what you've been talking about so far tonight. Complete streets, green infrastructure, improving the communication and the reliability of public transit so that people will use it. And I do have one little tidbit that Kim uh, helped us to get, um, get from, from the Zagster. Of all those trips you've talked about, you know what that relates to in terms of emissions. The Zagster folks estimated that about if, if all those extra trips replaced five percent of a car trip, that reduced about seventy-six thousand three hundred tons of CO two emissions. So that alone has already contributed to reducing emissions. So in the plan, we have actions that will encourage ride sharing, bike sharing, things like that, because they all have an emission impact. Um, so that's about it. Yeah, so uh, as we said, so the end of next week,
page. We hope the draft will be available online and we'll be sharing a link to that so everyone can view the um, proposed actions as a, as a total. Um, and we really encourage you to go ahead and provide your comments, your questions. Um, after about six weeks, eight weeks, after compiling all of those comments and a number of activities will be out in the community sharing the climate action plan and getting feedback, uh, the goal is then to present it to mayor and council and have them uh, adopt it as the plan for the community. Um, but in the meantime, we're working on actually implementing some of the, the climate action plan. Um, so also at the bottom of the agenda um, are just a list of the other 2019 municipal initiatives this year, um, which I encourage everybody to read through. Um, we had a lot of the agenda tonight, so we're not going to go through all of them individually. Um, but if people have questions or ideas or feel that their um, board or commission might have um, input into these, um, please let me know because we you know, want to get as many people involved as possible. And um, just as a final note, um, the next meeting, if you want to mark it on your calendars now, is going to be on October 7th. Um, and that meeting will likely focus on, um, at least partially, on goal setting for 2020, hard to believe. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and hopefully that we can have just this conversation was pretty in the weeds for a lot of things. Um, that next conversation, I think it's important for us all to take a step back and say, what are the things that we should be working on when it comes to transportation? And what are some of the things we should be putting on the list for 2020 to um, uh, make movement on what we see as um, the big goals out there? So I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I'm going to hang around for a little bit afterwards if people have further comments um, or questions or ideas. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight.